Shall we? Let's do it. Cool. All right, guys. So we are going to kick off. Um, super excited to do this. This is a, uh, I'd say, unscripted, just time for conversation. I happen to be in Vancouver. Jen and I talk a lot about personal growth, self-development, self-awareness, uh, truly what it means to be a leader. And we just thought there would be a fun opportunity to kind of get our team together and just talk on some of these topics. And I think so much of the time we were talking about clinic performance or clinical excellence or you know onboarding our newest clinicians. And we don't always have the time to actually sit back and look at all the nuances, I think, that come along with being a leader and also a lot of the challenges. And for any of you that are either in leadership roles or interested in moving into leadership roles, um, something I mention a lot to our team is oftentimes what stops us from progressing is not a skill set gap in the sense that we need to learn a new skill. It's actually a mindset gap, right? It's something of how we see the world, how we communicate, how we relate to ourselves. Um, and I thought it would be really fun to have a combo with you because in addition to being one of our top performing clinic directors in the company, um, I also think Jen is just an incredible human. And from you know, the hundreds of people we have in the company and that I get to interact with, uh, I really think she is one of one of how much she pursues her personal growth and also the self-awareness you've developed and yeah, just all the growth I've seen on the journey with you. So Thank you. Uh, yeah, I figured we'd dive into some topics and uh, yeah, to kick off. Um, so the book Radical Candor, we talk about that book a lot in the company and Radical Candor talks about what it means to be a great leader and a great manager. And when I think of that book, I always think of you because they talk about the, the key to great leadership is to care immensely and challenge directly. And it's been really interesting watching your leadership journey of as you found your voice and become, uh, I think that balance of, you know, raise your hand if you think Jen cares deeply about her team. Everyone's two hands up, Ooh. right? Yeah, right? <laughs> safe on that one. But that said, I've seen you hold people accountable and drive performance and make hard decisions and have hard conversations. Um, so I'm curious, just like when you reflect on your leadership journey, um, I think you started, my observations, you started it caring immensely and you had to learn to challenge directly. How's your leadership style evolved over the last four or five years? Mm, great question. Yeah. Um, I think caring deeply, first off, like comes quite naturally to me. Mm. Um, I think it goes back to like, just talk about self-awareness. I, I believe building self-awareness is something that when I was like 25, I'm like, this is something that I think is really important. Um, and also really, I knew that it would set me apart from everyone else if I just doubled down more on what my skill set was. So knowing that, you know, growing up, I've being, being a physio in general, I think we all naturally care about others, like we want to help others. And so taking that piece and then learning to do it as a leader mm. uh, for a team, for a company, for a mission, I think that's like greater than myself. Um, it's really just then bridging like my two passions mm. together. Uh, easier said than done, yeah. for sure. Um, Curious yeah. to double click on that. So what sparked for you? Like why did you think self-awareness is actually important to develop? Mm. Um, I mean, if I'm, if I'm being like super transparent, we're just gonna dive right into we're diving, it. Yeah, we're yeah, yeah. diving it. into this. Um, growing up for me, I think I had a really like typical Asian upbringing, which is, uh, you know, there, there's a bit of a mold. Like, you gotta have a good job, you gotta have a good career, you're gonna get married, mm. you know, have a good family. And so much of that was already just kind of like predetermined. And I was kind of put in this box. And as I graduated physio school and started working um, different jobs and different clinics, and it wasn't actually until I started working at Mayo that because I think the essence of Mayo is so different a lot mm -hmm. of what we do is like challenging the status quo i think it just inspired me to challenge my own status quo so like step outside of my box and being supported by like i've had great mentors you know yourself and other people who have pushed me to make mistakes fail um learn to get back up it's just i, I knew in order to do that well i had to understand myself and where i was Right. So I think so much of my upbringing is like, this is your end goal. This is where you want to get to. That's like point B. Mm. In order to get there, you got to figure out like point A. Mm. And I don't think a lot of people know where their point A is, which is 
how aware of you are, are you of yourself? Like you're truly like your strengths, your weaknesses, um, calling yourself out on your own bullshit. So for me, I just, I love finding out more about myself because I think it makes me more aware and it makes me a better leader to help others. Then I can start to see like where other people's strengths and weaknesses lie and help hopefully you guys and even our own clients like to get to their point B. Mm. So, yeah. Love that. Thanks for sharing. Um, I know in previous conversations, we've talked a lot about leadership and like what goes into being a leader. And what you said to me was that the most important thing is a sense of ownership, mm. ownership of self. I'm curious if you can elaborate, like, what does that mean to you? Ownership of, of self is a lot of like leadership of self. Mm. That's how I see mm. it. Right. Um, I used to think leadership as a, a position, like you, you wear a hat, like you're a clinic director, you're now a leader, you're a lead clinician, you're a leader. Right. Um, and I think in the way society is and the way the world is shaped, that that's kind of what we've been told. Right? Um, but the moment I shifted my, that mindset and be like, you know, we as individuals, as human beings, we're actually in charge of our own li lives, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Like you can be a leader of yourself, the way you show up for your family, your friends, like a daughter, a son, like the all those little behaviors, I think, trickle into, yes, when you wear that hat for your job, for your career, it just matters then so much more. Mm. But a lot of the work actually happens outside of these four walls. Right? So being a leader of self and then understanding that, I think that for me, it gave me so much more empowerment. I was like, oh shit, like if I can do this in my own life, then I can take, I, that's a transferable skill now. Like I can take that anywhere. Um, and I'm just really grateful that I get the opportunity to do that here at my own. Yeah, cool. So well said. Um, there's this author that I used to read a lot um, named Robin Sharma. He's got this book called Leader Without a Title. And I think he wrote it like 10 years ago or something. But I remember reading it. Was just the story was so resonant. And just since the early days of Mayo, I've often thought about like the best leaders in the company, like no job is beneath them. Like, for example, every time I go to a clinic, I like go to the washroom and I wipe the counter and I just make sure like it looks good because I know that matters and I don't care what my title is. Right. But most importantly, what I've seen the best people in our company in terms of highest potential and how they like grow into leadership roles, like this idea of leading without a title, uh, leading before you're actually in the role. Right. It's not that you show up and you're a clinic director and like you're all of a sudden a leader. Right. And I, I think you've demonstrated that since, you know, we met and we started kind of this whole journey together. Um, but that's something I think about a lot, which is there's people that are seeking leadership um, for the ego and for the mm. validation. And then there's people that seek leadership to serve. Mm. Right. And I think that ties into this other idea we talked about a lot, which is servant leadership. And, you know, it sounds like on this sequencing of like learning to lead yourself gives you the space to then lead others. Um, but I think you have a very particular leadership style and it's very effective, which to me kind of connotes servant leadership. So I'm curious like how you think about this idea of servant leadership. I'm curious of your definition of it. I'm happy to riff on it too, but. Mm. Um, I think servant leadership to me, it, it's very much like if you talk the talk, you walk the walk, mm. right? Like putting yourself in the other person's shoes first and foremost. And a lot of that comes from being empathetic. So. I, act, I think for me, I actually relate to being an empathetic leader first, then servant leadership kind of comes after. Servant to me is like the, the action of it. Mm -hmm. Like an empathetic leader is like the beingness of it. So um, yeah, for me doubling down on like, I am innately aware of my energy and of the people around me. I think that allows me to have a lot of empathy mm -hmm. for others. There are downsides to that for sure, which I've learned kind of the hard way over time. What are the downsides? Being, and we've talked about this. Yeah. I, remember, <laughs> I remember we had a call and we were like, you know, we're really similar in terms of um, how empathetic we are. Mm. And the downside is if we don't watch out for the, that if we get too granular, think on the feelings of it, and we lose sight of that bigger goal, that bigger mission, one, it leads to burnout. Um, which is like, probably what I've experienced over time and being able to like reflect and learn how to 
use empathy as a strength versus, you know, um, having it serve as like a disservice to myself. Mm. And, and something I continues to continue to work on every day. Um, and yeah, so just being able to like zoom out and think about why, why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. Like, is it for a greater purpose? Does it still serve my own personal why? Um, I think it's really important because sometimes we lose sight of what we're doing. Like we're, it's often like on autopilot. Mm -hmm. So being uh, a servant leadership, like I said, is the action of it. Mm -hmm. And that can feel very like autopilot mundane over time. Um, the empathy side is what makes us human and helps us like to connect with each other. And that's something that like no one can take away from you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like your unique power, I would say. Mm. Cool. So well said. Yeah. On, um, so on this topic of burnout, I, I heard this definition once which really stuck with me, which is burnout is when we're trying to give that which we don't have left to give. Mm. And I think when you're wired the way we are, which is caring deeply and highly empathetic, and you see someone on your team that needs that extra support, or you're going to go above and beyond for them, and you do that one too many times without recharging the batteries. Like I know over and over, I step into that pattern of just realize oh, I just went a little too much. And it's uh, as a skill actually to develop the awareness of, oh, I'm actually coming up to that edge. Mm. And even though I've crossed that 100 times, I recognize that now and I don't have to step over it. So I'm curious, like when you start to approach that sense of burnout, like what have you learned about yourself in terms of recharging your batteries and what actually refills you to be able to come back and be an effective leader? Mm. That's such a really interesting question because I, I reflect on that a lot. Yeah. Um, I think knowing what recharges you first and foremost is very important. Um, for me, a lot of it is like breath work, meditation, hmm. journaling. Um, I just did a you know sauna cold plunge before this. Nice. You know, trying to calm down the nerves and tap into that you know parasympathetic nervous system. Um, obviously, being a physio, I love like the science behind it. So yeah. it's a little bit of like a life hack, yeah. if you will. Um, so that, that recharges me for sure. Being around people that sometimes even like giving and be able to receive is rechargeable, depending on the conversation, right? Um, I think a lot of times when we think recharge, we think go into our hole and, you know, just be at home and just like turn everything off. Um, and I've tried that. And sometimes I'm like, you know, it's actually, that's not what I need. Like I need to call up a friend, like someone I can trust be vulnerable with and just be like, hey, I'm feeling like really low, really shitty. And you just never know that. I think that connection piece for me, because that's a big core value. Mm -hmm. When I can connect with someone on a deeper level, I actually leave that conversation feeling super recharged. Mm. Right? So yeah, I think about it a lot. And mm. I think it's something that continuously will change over time, depending on like what phase you are in your life. And I also don't think battery is like there's a limit mm. well i think what i'm personally going through right now being in like a personal development course is my capacity to actually grow that battery is getting bigger and mm -hmm. bigger and bigger so i'm constantly surprising myself and my burnout level is like pushed even further mm -hmm. away as i continue to um, dive into deeper challenges and like rise from occasions it's really cool to, to mm. feel and see in myself. Um, yeah, and I just hope like everyone here also gets the opportunity to like push your own boundaries a little bit. Um, and if you do reach a point of burnout, just know like you have support systems around you um, mm. to, to help you through that. What's the drive, like going back to like you pushing yourself and finding these edges and doing more personal development and wanting to like discover more of yourself. Like if you, if you feel into that, like what's actually the underlying drive for you? Because I think a lot of our team, I think we definitely attract a lot of what I call growth-minded people. Um, but I think you're far on that continuum of, of pushing, which is, I know we connect on that a lot. Um, what is it? Like, what drives that? Um, being really in touch with my why. Mm. So my why is to empower others to be a better version of themselves. And I, I think reminding, like, I wake up every day with that in, in my head. Mm. And every time I'm faced with a challenge, I go back to my why. And I think that connects so strongly with also Mayo's why, which is why it's like, yeah. you know, the kind of like perfect pairing, if yeah. you will. Um, and if we dig a little bit deeper, I think behind my why is very much based off 
um, a lot of it is based off actually like doing things for to leave a legacy behind. Mm. Um, I want to make sure my impact in this world is I'm leaving it in a better place, mm. um, and that my purpose is so much more than just what I can control. Like it's something that if I were to leave this world tomorrow, like I know I've inspired. If it's just even one person, like I, I can go to sleep happy. I think it's been more than one. <laughs> <laughs> you start with one, it grows a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah, and I think on a personal level, I, especially why I think Kits is really special for me is because, um, and we connected on this very early on, is um, a lot of it actually has to do with my dad. Mm -hmm. um, he, he passed when I was 10, and so much of, I think, why I'm in this career and why I continue to do what I do is very much in memory of him. Um, so that is like a really deeply rooted internal drive. Um, and yeah, I, I would say like I've learned to leverage that in mm. a way that moves me forward. Sometimes it also cannot serve me because I get in my own shit, you know, um, it becomes really emotional. But that's also why I have I've built like amazing support system and mm. have people like you to talk to about this stuff because it's it can be hard. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. Um, so just to share kind of personally too. So I lost my mom when I was 13, um, and there's something about there's something tied with hardship. I think as we were young, whether it's as a child or early teens, that really tends to transform into some sort of energy. And I think some people use that productively, and some people use it destructively. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, like as you think about hardship and how you transmute that you know, the challenges and the emotions and just there's trauma there that, you know, we're, we're dealing with our whole lives, mm -hmm. right? We feel like we resolve it and then there's another layer and another layer. Oh, so okay. as this comes up and as you remember, like, what got you here? I'm curious, like, how do you think about taking the hardships in your life and actually using them to fuel your journey versus being uh, an anchor for you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think naturally I'm like a really optimistic person. Mm. <laughs> um, I remember growing up and my mom would always just be like, you're always just smiling, always just laughing. Like you're so naive to like the, the evil that's around in this world. Mm. And I, I think even to this day, I'm like, I choose to see things optimistically. Like I want to see this world in a better place. So quite naturally, if I'm going through a hardship or a challenge, like, yes, it's okay to feel the emotion behind it, but then I'll always, go back to like, okay, how do I move this forward in a positive way? Um, and that is just like, it, over time, I think it gets easier and easier because um, then you learn to not sit in that emotion for too long where mm. it becomes destructive, as you say, um, or starts affecting like your self-esteem. Worst case scenario, you know, you start being irritable around the people around you and it can start hurting others, right, that you actually care about. So, yeah, I, I think just choosing and knowing that you have a choice mm. to think, you know, glass half full in every situation, like look for the good in all of it because it is there. Um, and even like probably the, the biggest challenge was like COVID. Like that was going to ask about that. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> just to turn the clock back. So we built this beautiful clinic. Jen was leading the charge, ready to open it. What did we have? Three weeks open before COVID hit? Something like that? Exactly a month. Yeah. Exactly a month. So um, just a complete left turn we did not expect. Um, so I'm curious, like as a first time business owner, so Jen's a partner in Kits and plays a significant role just building it to what it is today. So as a first time business owner, you put some skin in the game, like a real investment here. COVID happened. Oh, yeah. How did you manage that emotionally back that first six months, that first year as we were navigating that? Like what, what allowed you to get through that? Um, bringing up some traumas there, Scott. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what allowed me to get through it? I think when I look back, like, honestly, I was a bit naive. Mm. I think being a first time business owner, I didn't know what to expect. Um, I kind of took like my entire life saving and, and I was like, yeah, let's do this. Like, let's open a clinic. It's like a dream of mine. I've always wanted to do. Yeah. And then to then have that happen. And there was so much uncertainty and it, once I zoomed out, I'm like, it's not just me. Mm. This is like impacting the world at scale. So 
knowing that I wasn't going through it alone, I think was really helpful. <laughs> yeah. Like, Crazy we, we would just hop on calls and be like, yo, you, you alive? Like, you're good, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and I think that just knowing that we have a huge support system uh, was great. Um, the team here, I mean, like the founding team, like I remember being on like Zoom calls and just thinking to myself like, wow, I need to be strong for these guys. Mm. Like so many of them just came out of school, hired full time, like reliant on a job for like their living, like that. And for them to trust, not just in me, but in the clinic, a brand new clinic and the company, I think there was a lot of pressure for me to just be like, okay, stay strong, stay positive, stay optimistic and work with what you have. And doubling down then on culture, right? Um, like educating and inspiring still with what we could do, like our skill set mm. virtually, it just learned and I think got us to shift and think creatively, which I look back and like, that was a blessing in disguise mm -hmm. for sure. So I think a lot of what makes kits really special is because we went through that time together. Like it, it was like, there's a, all of us in this room right now, like it was a rough time, right? Um, but we had fun with it. And I think knowing that at the end of the day, we were gonna, we were gonna open again. Mm even though there's always like that little voice be like, oh fuck, like yeah. we might not. Yeah. Um, not letting that show mm. was potentially what pushed me through. Yeah. Right. Um, I think I would have done it a little differently though. Mm. If I were to look back, like I didn't quite understand myself as well back then. So I wasn't really vulnerable in the whole process. Mm. It was very much like put on a mask, get it done, like show no weakness. Yeah. It worked, but knowing who I am now, I probably would have. I think that's chapter one of all of our leadership journeys, which <laughs> yeah. is like, just be strong. Don't show anything. Don't, like, yeah. you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just go home and cry, but yeah. it's okay. Yeah. yeah. It's like that imposter syndrome, like, why am I even in this role? Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, leaning into vulnerability, I realize is also hmm. a bit of a superpower. Um, what sparked that learning? Like, how did you come to that realization? Hmm. When I started actually having, like sharing my thoughts mm. out loud. Um, and of course it takes like people who you trust and just knowing that then the feedback was like, wow, I actually respect you so much more because you were able to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. That's a really courageous step. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that could be seen as courage. Mm. I, I really didn't. Like that's not what I was taught growing up. Mm -hmm. right. So I think to have that feedback and that shift and then like doing it a little bit more each time, mm -hmm. like, oh, that's just super uncomfortable. Like, let's lean into that. Um, I think it gave me like momentum to keep going. And then obviously like reading a lot, like Brene Brown talks a lot about vulnerability mm -hmm. and courage. And I love her work, Simon Sinek as well. Like those are two people that I, I listen to a lot of their podcasts and read their books on. And um, yeah, it resonates well with me mm -hmm. so i just chose to dive into that lean into that a little mm -hmm. bit heavier yeah. yeah cool well said so interesting like just going back to the the covid and persevering through that and just keep going um i heard something what's which really stuck with me which is leaders have to do two things one is we have to see things as they are right we have to embrace reality as it is and we have to see them better as they are mm -hmm. right because if we're going to be able to communicate a vision to a team and be able to lead people from where we are to where we need to go like those really are the two skill sets. And I think because you have that optimism bias, um, but you are grounded, like that, that's the opportunity. And that's kind of what I saw as you navigate through COVID and then all the learnings you accumulate on the other side and you just see like the momentum at KITS is, you know, it's like unstoppable now. So it's exciting, yeah. super exciting. Um, so I'm curious, like as, you know, you've gone through all this growth career, like today as we sit here, like what are you struggling with as a leader? Good question. Um... I actually just talked about that with, with, with Julia earlier. I think one of the things I, I'm better at, but still kind of struggling is, I think because I care so deeply and I came from a very, especially at Mayo, like a small knit, close family kind of feel um, back in 2017 mm -hmm. when, you know, it was just a few clinics and the team was like a third of the size. Yeah. Um, I think 
sometimes I struggle to see like how we can continue to grow and scale uh, without losing sight of what makes us like kind of special and unique. Mm. Right? And um, it, it, my view around that, my mindset around that has already shifted and changed over time. I think just listening to, you know, Charles talk, you talk about it as well. And knowing that it's not one or the other, it definitely is a game of end. Mm. Like you can have both a really large, successful organization filled with many individual leaders and also feel like close knit and tight with each other, mm -hmm. fist bumping, you know, like, and have great one on one conversations. There is a world where both exists. Mm -hmm. And so that in itself is, I would say, as a leader, is like my, my biggest challenge mm -hmm. I see and I face every single day. Uh, as I continue to grow mm. myself. So. Can I build on that for a second? Sure. So I think what I, I think about that a lot. Um, how do we grow without losing our soul? And I, I think we have, as a culture, picked up a lot of ideas around what it means to be big and corporate through um, a lot of years of shitty big and corporate companies sort of dominating the ecosystem. And I think what's really unique about both this moment in time that we're building a company in 2024 um, but also Mayo as a culture, the fact that we, as a company, are just a very young, hungry, energetic culture. And um, it's such a great opportunity for us, like just given like how we interact on Slack, how we've digitized the entire experience, like how we connect the regions, even though we're not physically together, there is a sense of camaraderie and it's so cool. You know, even like these Lulu events we're doing and people are flying from every region to like go hang out and build memories and build experiences and connections. Um, I think as we continue to prioritize and recognize like, how do we keep the soul strong no matter if we have 300 people or 1,000 or 3,000? And what are we doing to reinforce that constantly? The fact that we're thinking about this now versus 10 years from now, if we totally miss the boat, like it's so hard to fix, right? We can't turn the clock back on this stuff. And I think we, I think about like, you know, it's like the analogy of like, we've got this fire and we can't let the fire go out. And that's why who we reinforce as leaders in the company and what we reinforce as leaders in the company, um, that will be the thing that either 10 years from now will be like, fuck, we did it. Like we've grown to X thousand or X number of clinics and we've kept that soul alive or <laughs> we missed the boat somewhere. Yeah. Right? But I, I, I feel so optimistic we're getting there. And I do think that it's, it is a practice of trust because we are building something that hasn't been built before. Right? So it's, it's on us to make sure if that is the value we want to hold on to, like how do we make sure that value of like caring deeply is felt no matter, like we could have 10,000 people and it, it still is there with every single team member. Mm -hmm. um, that's on us to ritualize, right? And how we onboard people and how we reinforce that behavior and how we like give people space to show up as their authentic selves at work all the time versus having like whatever, you know, yeah. put this mask I, on at work. Yeah, I, and to double down on yeah. that, I think even just seeing the shift that our company has had in the past year, where we're really coming back to like our core values, like refining that mission statement and getting so clear on that at every single level, mm. every single department, like all the leaders are identifying, resonate it with some shape, some you know form. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why having, you know, coming back to the core values and our mission and uh, clinical principles and just having that dripped out in everything that we do, I think is what gets us to really like narrow in when it's, it starts to feel really yeah. like big. Yeah. There's always that North star to go back to. Exactly. Right? Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think it's fantastic just to see like even being a part of the growth yeah. within this company and yeah. like noticing, you know, sometimes we're like, Oh, lost sight of that a little bit. Like how do we dial it in? Mm -hmm. um, and if we just continue to like refine, that as a whole and at a ma macro level like if we refine that in ourselves like i think we're pretty unstoppable yeah so yeah well said cool um so i'm gonna ask jen one more question and i'll throw it to anyone so if you have a question boiling um we'll probably have time for like four or five questions so we'll get into it um so my last question for you is just i mean you've been involved in a lot more kind of top level conversations at the offsite lately and kind of some of the slack stuff you're, you're involved with what are you feeling most excited about like as you look kind of towards the future where are things you're feeling stoked about? Um, I think the people. Yeah. It, it always comes back to the people. Like every time I, I do a recharge, a even a one on one, like even sitting in this in this room right here, like looking at the immense amount of talents 
that you guys either know you have or you don't know you have yet. Mm. I think that untapped potential, that's what excites me. And so, I mean, full circle, it comes back down to like self-awareness. Mm -hmm. right? So um, if you are, if you're going to work on yourselves, then have and have that self-awareness and continue to invest in yourself so that you can be, you can also see that untapped potential within you and other people around you. Like we're just, then we're just lifting each other up. Yeah. Like then we're fucking unstoppable, yeah. you know, like we can move mountains with that. Um, so I think, yeah, super cool. excited about the people, the talent, it's the really young um, energy and there's a lot of experience as well that comes with that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. So well said. I totally agree. I think that um, something I felt resistance about in the past, less so now, I think we're like in a good cadence, but in the past, sometimes we were growing or opening new clinics and I was getting resistance of like, why are we growing? Or like, what are we doing? And if you saw what I see, which is like, I get to interact with every region and all these rising stars, like we have so many untapped leaders in the company that are just being nourished and they, they don't, necessarily see it in themselves yet. I think, I mean, I know this with you and with me, like oftentimes our self identity lags behind our actual competence by a couple of years, right? So we're, we're trying to catch up with understanding like, oh, here are my strengths, here are my weaknesses, when other people so clearly see that in us. And that I think from now your vantage point of actually being able to go through some cycles every year and seeing, oh wow, like this is how I nurture people, this is how I develop people, you could start seeing that earlier and earlier. And I mean, that's, I feel this positive pressure, um, as I'm sure you do too, is like people are so hungry and people want more opportunities and they want to be exposed to more um, title or not. It's just like, I think we're getting to this inflection point of um, people recognizing when they go above and beyond um, and just demonstrate like they're trying to create value and um, engagement in the company, like opportunities will find them. And it's, it's cool. I think the next few years is gonna be really fulfilling. I think seeing a lot of the, people we, we've recognized now and like they start to move into uh, new roles and yeah. new opportunities. So yeah. yeah, so fun. It's a great journey. Yeah, cool. Um, all right, floor is open. Um, I can take questions, Jen can take questions, so fire away. I would love to kick it off with Julia. You asked me an earlier great question around past, present, and future for leadership and I'd yeah. love you to kick that off with Jen. Yeah. Like, yeah, I was curious, Jen, if you could speak to how you view yourself or how you viewed yourself as a leader in the past how you view yourself as a leader now and how you view yourself potentially in the future? Mm, good question. Um, I would say in the past, how I viewed myself as a leader was you got to put on the hat, right? Like once mm. I, if I'm a team captain or if I'm a CD or whatever, like it's, it's a role. That's how I would view myself as a leader. Um, present day, obviously very different. I view myself as a leader of myself first and foremost, um, not as a clinic director. Um, and that trickles into like my relationships with my friends, my mom, with my coworkers, you know, um, like a deeper connection even, like I think a lot of people at work are like my closest friends too, right? Um, so just being able to share in that and knowing that leadership is not limited to a title, that's where I am now. Future, um, great question. Hmm. I don't know yet. Uh, I think that's probably the exciting part of it. You know, um, I, I can only hope that the leader I become is very much still aligned with my most truest authentic self. Um, so as long as I'm, you know, staying true to my values and my why, then whatever happens, happens. <laughs> hmm. Cool, well said, thanks for the question. Next question. Anything else? What's the difference between managing and leading? And how did you determine that for yourself? And how did you work yourself through that process? Mm. Um, managing feels very task orientated to me. And so don't get me wrong, I think, you know, to be a good leader, you, you kind of have to do both sometimes. Um, but yeah, managing is, is, is very task orientated. It's like taking a, a tool and then like implementing it, right? Being a leader, however, is then, how do you then take that tool knowing that it has to be used and inspire someone else to, to use it as well? 
So I would say, yeah, leadership is more about the relationship mm. um, and the, the, the connection and the beingness behind it. Managing is just like, yeah, you can tell someone to do it and they'll may or may not do it. <laughs> yeah. mm. Is that the, you had a second question after that or that was good? How did you get to that realization? Uh, um, yeah, by, by, by managing and realizing that didn't work. <laughs> Uh, it, it doesn't feel good. It does not feel good when um, you fail at something. And I, I think coming back to like reflecting on it and knowing like, oh, man, that just didn't sit well with me. Like I don't go to bed, um, you know, feeling good. And I never used to know why. Like I, I would stay up all night. I'd be really anxious. I had to deal with a lot of anxiety. And once I realized it's just because I didn't understand what my most authentic version of me was. Then um, once I learned to shift that, I was like, oh, this feels a lot better. I can sleep at night now. Cool. OK. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. Cool. So to, just to build on that, it's really interesting Like watching your journey. Um, a realization I've had is like how important it is to actually develop our own style over time. Mm -hmm. Right When we're early in our leadership journey, we tend to uh, model mentors and advisors and like books and be like, OK, this is how a leader should behave or how we should show up. And then at some point, you cross a threshold, I think for most people, uh, to start to give ourselves permission to actually just be ourselves. Mm. And that's, I, I kind of capture that idea of like developing your own style. Um, so I'm curious, like today, how do you define your style of leadership? I don't even know if there's a word for it yet. <laughs> um, you can coin it. Coin it? Yeah. Bit like genial leadership. That, that, that's where. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I don't really know. I think it's a, it's a it's a perfect blend. Yeah, what are the ingredients in yeah, the recipe? Yeah, you know, like and it's for me like intention. It always comes down to that, like being really clear about my intention and how I, I talk about this with the team a lot. Intention versus mechanism. Like if you're clear about your intention, how you get there, the mechanism. That's the fun part. Hmm. And it can change. And there's an infinite number of ways to do it. So my leadership style is just like be super clear on what I want that's authentic to my core values. And I will always come back to my top three core values. And then the process and how I achieve that, like it could be different tomorrow. And it could be different depending who I'm talking to as well um, in order to draw something out of that person in front of me. Hmm. So being a bit of a chameleon in that area, um, I just have fun with it. Like so much of what we do sometimes in, in work can feel really serious. And I think my closest friends will know me to probably be a bit of a goofball. And you know, so yeah, yeah have fun with it. Figure out your own style. Um, it sounds super cliche, but like, you know, if it, it, you're your own unique human being. Like we are all really unique individuals. So don't try to copy anyone else because it's already been done before. Um, just put your own spin on it. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Well said. Yeah. Uh, other questions? I, I've heard, we heard you talk about the past, the future, the present, uh, your leadership style. Uh, but I want to know what is the ultimate goal that leadership brings? And how do you strive to a team with your own leadership style? Um, rephrase the question. What is the ultimate goal for, in, leadership. for leadership? What's the ultimate goal for leadership? Um, I think in general, the ultimate goal in leadership is to be the best human being you can possibly be. Um, and for some, that could be, you know, just crushing it as a clinician. And that's a OK. Right. And it comes back to intention. Like, if that's what you want to do, then like, do it well. Mm. Like, put like 100% of your energy and your, your source into that. Um, but if you set your, your sight on like something bigger, greater, and I think that's where my drive comes from, it's just like, having a purpose bigger than myself, then that's awesome too, right? We kind of call, coin it like superstars and, and rock stars, mm. right? Um, so if you want to strive to be a superstar, then you know, you're 
probably going to want to surround yourself with other superstars to push you. Um, and so, yeah. Oh. Mm. That's how leadership wins at the end of the day. Mm. <laughs> That's good. Uh, more questions? Uh, yeah. This is for another Jenner Scott. I think all of us in the room at some point uh, probably experienced imposter syndrome. So just curious how you deal with that personally. And then in terms of leadership, how you guys help support teammates colleagues who maybe have gone through that. Let me take it? Heather? I'll go first. Yeah, go for it. Um, I think imposter syndrome is inevitable that we all have to go through it because when you go into a new role, you probably suck at it. Like it's, especially if it's a new job, like clinic director, lead clinic, whatever it is, like it's your first time in that job. And yeah, they just, it takes time to actually get the hang of the basics and the blocking and tackling, first of all. And like I said earlier, our self-identity, it, it always lags behind our competence. So you might actually be getting better at the role. You might be getting better at managing, leading, having hard conversations. Um, that doesn't mean you will feel less anxiety about it or you might lose sleep at night. Like That's still going to be there. Um, and that's why I think perseverance is so critical. And I actually think people that have gone through hardship earlier in life tend to do better in that phase because they'll just keep going. Right? And the reality is like a lot of times if we have really hard days and we want to quit, like I had a day last week, I was like, I'm ready to quit. Like I'm out. I was just having such a bad day. Like everything was going wrong. I was getting just, I probably had like 10 hard things land on my plate that day. And I felt like nobody appreciated what I did. <laughs> no one's acknowledging me. I'm like, I'm fucking out. Um, but that's because I'm pushing my edge a lot. Like I, a lot of the stuff I'm doing is so hard for me, um, and I'm trying to do a lot of it at once, and it's super complicated. And I'm managing a lot of emotions at the same time, but that's to me like the path for my self-actualization. Like for me to become, to Jen's earlier point, like I have a drive to become like the best version of myself, and I will not get there by being super comfortable. So that means I am almost perpetually in some state of that imposter syndrome because I'm doing new things. For example, we opened a new clinic this week. All of a sudden, I'm now, I've never managed 16 clinic company before, right? Next month when we open the next, you know, by the end of this year, we'll have 20 plus clinics. Like I've never managed 20 clinic company before, but I'm going to be doing that by the end of this year. And that's going to pose new challenges, right? New complexity. There's more people. So by the very nature of our success, it actually will open up this path that we have to keep marching down. So we sort of, what I've recognized, like we perpetually move in and out of that imposter syndrome and you will be in a role. And then a year or two later, you will feel like you've mastered it and you can do it. You know, the things that you may have um, felt extreme anxiety about, now it like, doesn't phase you at all, right? But if you're on that path of self-actualization, like, it will keep coming. Um, and then the second part of your question of like, how do I coach and guide people through that is a lot of times when people are experiencing the anxiety attached to imposter syndrome, they just need a container to be held in. And I think Jen is particularly great at that as a leader, which is why so many of her team members come to her and have deeply thoughtful one-on-ones because she can hold the space for that as a leader. And I think no matter what the title is or the role you want to go in or anything, um, at the end of the day, we're managing human beings. And if you can learn to hold a human being to make them feel seen and heard and understood, to me, that takes the, uh, if you imagine the anxiety as a balloon, it sort of takes the air out of the balloon and it allows them to get back to a place of being grounded and what the actual problem is they need to solve or what they're feeling anxious about or whatever. And that's, it, it really is just every time as leaders or managers, we can help a team member um, solve a problem. It unlocks, I think about like this little diamond of confidence in themselves, right? And you know, as leaders, we're just there helping you collect the diamonds and the diamonds and they grow and grow and grow. And then it's, it's really cool. I mean, especially probably the most fulfilling part of Mayo so far has been, you know, it's like, my 10 year anniversary in October this year. Like I've been doing this for almost 10 years. And some of the people have been with us for like eight, nine, 10 years and watching their personal growth. And just, I mean, them today, the version of today compared to even five years ago, like they could just run circles around themselves five years ago because they've grown so much. And it's been so fulfilling um, being on the journey, watching them and knowing how many hard conversations they've had, how many late nights they might have just been like fighting with themselves over a problem. Um, but that's why I think we have this core pillar in the, the business and the company as um, we attract a lot of people with a growth mindset because 
we have people that want to push and want to be uncomfortable and want new opportunities. Um, so the quick summary to your question is, like, I totally think it's part of the journey. I don't think you ever solve imposter syndrome. I think if you are continuing to march down the path, like, there's always another version of it. But you will find your style to keep kind of moving through it. So, is that helpful? Cool. Anything to add? Yeah, no, I, I think really well said. I love the, the diamond analogy. Yeah. Did, did you just come up with that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the spot. That's how you do things. Yeah, um, yeah I think just to, to, to add to that, like, I used to think imposter syndrome was very, like, it's just about me. And when you realize, like, we all have and will go through it, it just makes it feel a lot less lonely and a lot less anxious. And so... Um, how I coach is just like relating, like, hey, what you're going through, I, I know you may not feel that, but I've gone through exactly that, All right? So like, talk me through exactly what you're feeling, because imposter syndrome, is, it, it comes down to a feeling. It's not actually mm. who you are. It doesn't define like whether you're successful or not. And so holding space, like that container, to get that person to to express like why they're feeling what they're feeling, um, I think in itself is is a recipe to tackle imposter syndrome, and then also knowing, like to reframe a little bit of imposter syndrome, it's you probably feel it because other people see you better than you see yourself, and when you can realize that, it's like okay, now how do I just rise to that occasion? All right. And then it becomes a okay, like, let's learn, like, mm. let's figure it out. Like, let's fill in the gap versus, ah, I'm just shitty. <laughs> Very different. Mm. Yeah, Very well said. Cool. Great question. Thanks for that. Uh, we'll take two more and we'll wrap up. Would you suggest they start finding their North Compass and their why and their core values so that as they do so they can lead authentically and not just follow things that they read or mimic other people? Yeah, really find like, how do you essentially get someone to figure themselves out when they're starting that? Good question. Yeah, well, maybe. Right. Um, so I, I think a lot about identity as Imagine there's a balloon, and our whole life we pick up pieces of paper mache, and we're just paper macheing over this balloon. And like who we actually are is this balloon. But over time, we pick up behaviors, ways of being, traumas, all this stuff of like how we think we are. Ultimately, to answer the question, like who are we? Right. To to your question, it's like who I authentically am. Like what's my north star? To answer that question, you actually have to know who you are. And the only way we learn who we are is asking the question. And it's very easy to avoid that question our entire lives and just go through the narratives and sort of pick up the stories. Um, something that I think you're well suited for and I tend to be wired for is we do a lot of reflection. I, say, I think both Jen and I tend to be more introverted and do a lot of reflection. There tends to be two types of people. One is someone that needs that solitude and actually like, wants to go inside. And others tend to be um, more extrovert and they need to talk it out with somebody. And both work, but ultimately the core of your question is asking yourself, like, who am I? And my observation is very few people take the time to truly do that. Um, a technique I've found super helpful if you are tend to be more introverted is um, I do a lot of journaling on my laptop, but I'll actually, it's almost like meditative where I'll actually wear a sleep mask so I can't see my screen. So I'm not judging the words coming out. And I'm actually just like feeling into my emotions and typing out and saying, and one of the questions I ask a lot is like uh, exploring identity, like who am I? Okay, I'm not a CEO. I'm not this name that was just given to me. It's totally arbitrary. On and on, I'm not my education. And you start like going down and it, 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 it's not a one day thing. It's a multi-year thing of asking yourself that and sort of pursuing that. And it's, it's just like removing, back to that analogy of the paper mache, it's like, burning away layer after layer after layer after layer and having the courage to face yourself and realize there's probably a lot of narratives and things you believe about yourself that are total bullshit. And until we have the courage to look inwards, um, those narratives or ways of being will just persist. 
And what's really interesting about going into leadership roles or management roles is they expose you more than anything else. Like I actually think being you know, a CEO or a clinic manager or you know, in these kind of manager roles, they are the best arena to force the growth because there's a lot of days I feel like really shitty in certain ways of like, oh my God, I like didn't say this well, or I you know, missed this deadline, or I um, upset this person because of something I said, and it immediately forces me to reflect on why did I do this? How can I do this better? Um, and how anchored is this into who I actually am versus I made a mistake, whatever the case is. So um, just I think to wrap all the answer up, like there's deep reflection that needs to happen. And that can happen in the form of a coach or a therapist or a friend or an entrepreneur group or a peer group, or it can happen, you know, with a tea and a candle and a journal. And both are totally valid options, but at the core of what you're asking is um, understanding what is your North Star. And then you are able to turn around and start to express that in the world in ways that are uniquely yours um, because you, you are actually more in touch with it. And to your earlier point, like just really accepting ourselves as we are. And I think, uh, I know you felt this pressure. I felt this pressure. When you're early in your leadership journey, you're just trying on all these different masks. You're like, should I be like this? Should I be like this? Or, and uh, when you start to drop all those away, then actually like, the authenticity can come through. So, Yeah. Um, I think to, to add to that, Bree, someone who even like thinks about that question mm. already is a first is like the first step, because I think majority of people in this world, maybe not at Mayo, or else it wouldn't be at Mayo, um, don't even ponder that question. Like, what is my identity? What is my most authentic self? Like, what are my core values? So to even think about that, like, that's the first step. And that's awesome. And a little exercise that I, I've done for myself, and I think I've done with a few people here, is I actually go through a, like, a hundreds uh, core value list. And then I start with, like, what are 20 core values that just resonate with me? I just write them out. From there, break it down to 10. From there, break it down to 5. And what you end up with is, like, top five core values. You don't need to, like, justify what those core values is to anyone else but yourself. Because hmm. there's no one core value that's superior to the other. It's just authentic to you. Mm -hmm. And so once you have the, the top five, then I do this other exercise where I go, okay, well, what are like four goals I have in life? And one's a physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And every goal I write out, it needs to somehow relate back to one of those five core values. And because a lot, often what we do, I think as humans is we set ourselves a goal and we have no idea why we're achieving it. So that's why we fail at achieving that goal because it doesn't resonate with you true enough to who you are which comes back to your core values. So I think making that relationship between what you're chasing, what you're going mm. after, and, and aligning it with your most authentic self, which are your core values, that's like the perfect recipe to really start figuring out who you are. Mm. Cool, well said. Helpful? Cool. All right, final question of the evening. Who wants to close it out? Going once. Um, so you guys have mentioned that you know, in Mayo we have so many like bright upcoming leaders and stuff. But however, we only have a certain amount of clinics and a certain amount of leadership positions. Um, how would you? What, what kind of advice would you give them that they can start working on from day one that they start till you know they eventually get leadership position open up? Okay, not me. Okay, okay. Um, I think kind of starting on the journey, I think the most important thing is um, a sense of ownership around the clinic that you're in, first of all. Um, I think it's so important to like bring great energy into a clinic and just back to this idea of leading without a title, like recognize each of us has an impact in the culture of the clinic, the energy, the positivity, the client experience, like all of these things matter. And I think getting really comfortable um, recognizing like the interplay of a team and the importance of like, every personality, it, it matters. And you, it could be your very first day at Maya and you can like massively influence the culture at you know, that individual clinic level. 
And what we've seen of like how people start to stretch into these leadership roles is they start to go above and beyond in so many different ways. And it could be as simple as like you start participating more regionally and start to get to know the leaders kind of in, in the region. Um, you know, we've had a lot more opportunities to do these cross regional events, especially with like our partnership with Lulu le lately. We've done like a bunch of events with them. Um, so I think if you're demonstrating like a lot of forward momentum, both kind of culturally and how you're showing up as a human being, and then also from a performance perspective, like you're really developing, uh, I'll speak from a clinician perspective as, as a great clinician and sort of embodying clinical excellence, like that will build enough momentum where opportunities will find you to stretch yourself and say yes to things. And it may not come with a title right away, but if I look to many of the people in leadership roles today, it's like, they just, it was so inevitable and it was so obvious where they were heading. Yeah, a few people in the audience. So. Um, and that's, that's it. And it's, you know, what, probably the thing that keeps me up the most at night is I actually think our, uh, the opportunities we have as a platform and just all the things we're saying no to today because we actually don't have enough leaders ready to go. So I actually think we are behind on developing people um, relative to like how many things are happening over the next couple of years. So I think you're going to see like a acceleration of how many roles start to open up. And the thing I think we're getting a lot better at is actually training people ahead of the curve. Uh, if you had asked me five years ago, like what clinic director training looked like, it was nothing. nothing. You showed up on day one. We're like, OK, we've updated your Jane permissions to full access. And uh, <laughs> good luck. Good luck managing your team. Um, you know, but just you know, I'll show Nathan Vandercoop. A lot of the, the work the RDs have done, Nathan's done um, developing just a much more tried and true method of how do we onboard leaders. And uh, you know, our leader in training program is a great example where we've taken how many people now through that program? Yeah, so 30 people in the company through our leader in training program, which is really about understanding behind the scenes, the fundamentals, the mindsets of what it feels like and looks like to go into these roles. So you're in a better position to inform like, oh, I actually want to do that. Or now that I've seen that, I actually recognize like, maybe I don't love business as much as I did, or maybe business is way more appealing to me than I thought it was. So we're really trying to give um, as much exposure early and the earlier, the better. I think. Um, so we're still playing a lot with these ideas, but I think we're starting to find ways that we uh, do this in a way that there's a much more clear path, right? Even on day one, if you like, in three, four years, I want to be a clinic director, what does it take to get there? We're going to have, I think, a much more straightforward way to get there as well. Yeah. Anything to add? Um, I think don't be afraid to like speak it out loud, like tell your clinic director tell the leaders like that that's what you're going for because mm. i think we often kind of hide and we're like oh i'll just i'll just wait until the right opportunity comes up and then i'll put my hand up um but if you're really inspired and that is something that you want to do like talk like we, i think Mayo has a really great system where our clinic directors are meant to support literally your caseload your dreams your aspirations so um, like, I love it when people are just like, hey, can we grab coffee? Like, can we just chat? Because that's where the most authentic conversations come in. And um, yeah, don't be afraid to, to, to speak it out loud. Like, put it out there. Sometimes that's actually the scariest part. Mm. I know it was for me, so mm -hmm. you just never know. Yeah. All said. Any closing words? Closing words. Um, oh, I think the biggest thing is just if we're coming back to like um, personal development and leadership of self, always look to not just inspire yourself, but inspire the people around you. Mm. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm just I'm just grateful to even have this opportunity to to share my story. So thank yeah, you, great. thank you for this. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and I think very much like my success is doesn't come without like you know a lot of support from you and from a lot of other mentors that I've had great examples working off of. So um, very much building off the shoulders of giants. Yeah, yeah. We're all learning from each other. So super cool. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks,